Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is part three of Ireland's Last Aristocrat. This episode is the final part of the series where we follow Olive Pakenham Mahan's story through the Civil War and then the decades that followed Irish independence when the money starts to run out and she is increasingly divorced from the realities of life in Ireland in the 20th century. She's increasingly a relic of a bygone age. Now, obviously, there's been two episodes in the series so far about Olive Packen and Mahan's life. And rather than recap her whole life story at the start of today's episode, I have peppered little details I felt necessary throughout the show. Obviously, if you haven't heard anything about Olive's story so far, I would recommend going back and listening to the first two parts of the series before you dive into today's show. But if you want to get straight into it, it should work as well. This introduction to the show is actually recorded just after I've returned from the supporters' trip to Conway in Wales. We had a really great time. The weather was spectacular. And as it has been for seven centuries, the castle was fascinating. It was also really great to catch up with some of the show supporters in person. And we had such a great time. I'm already planning the next supporters' trip. So if you'd like to join me, keep an eye out. There will be another one. Before we start today's show, I just want to say there's also going to be a bonus supporters episode based on recordings I made in Strokestown Park House as well. There's lots of interesting stories coming up in that show that I couldn't fit into the final edit of this episode. Anyway, you can get that at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. If you become a supporter, you'll also get access to my upcoming series on the Civil War. The first episode of that is nearly ready to go as well. So far, I've sat down with Dr. Brian Hanley from the History Department of Trinity College Dublin for two extensive interviews. We have one more to go before the series will be finished and ready, and that will be released on patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Finally, before we begin, I have to do the thank yous. This series was based on the work of a lot of people. So it wouldn't have happened without the generous time of Martin Fagan, the archivist, and Ushin O'Driscoll, the historian and guide in Strokestown Park House. Tony Aspel, who works in Strokestown, deserves a special mention as well. The series started after Tony reached out last summer. Sound on this episode and the series in general was from Kate Dunley. The fantastic artwork is from Keith Hines and the narrations are from Aidan Crow and Therese Murray. Christmas 1921 was a strained time in the Pakenham Mahan household. Traditionally, the family had spent the festive season on their Strokestown estate in County Roscommon, Ireland. However, in 1921, they remained in London. Travelling back to Strokestown wasn't even contemplated that year. It was far too risky. Their home, Strokestown Park House, and the surrounding town was on a knife edge, An uneasy truce between the IRA and the Crown forces in Ireland had come into effect the previous July, bringing the War of Independence to an end. This had been followed by protracted negotiations between representatives of the Republican movement and the British government. However, while people prayed for a lasting peace, many expected these talks would fail and war would restart. Indeed, the IRA had continued to recruit and come out into the open, making their presence felt in towns and cities across Ireland in anticipation of a renewed conflict. This was particularly the case in Strokestown. By later 1921, something of a standoff had developed in the town as local IRA companies occupied the workhouse overlooking the village while the British Army remained in the Packenham Mahan House a few hundred metres away. The situation was so grave it was raised by a Conservative MP, Stephen Gwynne, in the House of Commons. The military forces are occupying a large private house. In the same place a force of the Irish Republican Army, two or three times as strong, is stationed in the workhouse, armed with machine guns and a bombing section with armed sentries continually posted. While a treaty between Irish Republicans and the British government was agreed by Christmas 1921, it was still unclear whether the Irish Republican Parliament, the Doyle, would accept its terms. If they rejected the treaty, war would restart immediately. Strokestown Park House could well become the site of an intense battle, and the prospect of eating Christmas dinner, with a potential war looming over them, was not exactly enticing. So, 
it was little surprise that the Packenham Mahant remained in London. In any case, the family had been kept in England by a scandal of sorts as well, or an event that some members of the family at least considered a scandal. During a brief visit to Strokestown the previous summer, Olive had started a whirlwind romance with Stuart Hales, one of the soldiers garrisoned in the house. The couple had been engaged within two weeks, but Olive's parents had been lukewarm at best about this. They considered Stuart beneath their daughter. And while they couldn't stop the strong-willed Olive marrying Stuart, they insisted on a small wedding. Olive revealed to Stuart about how his new parents-in-law were less than enthusiastic about the marriage in a letter from late 1921. I personally am all in favour of keeping it as quaint as possible, and we are asking no one but near relations and ten extremely intimate friends. I hope you agree with me, but even if you do not, I am afraid it cannot be helped now, as my family have absolutely made up their minds. Further to this, they also ensured that Strokestown Park House and the family fortune would remain within the Packenham Mahan name, So given Olive was an only child, they insisted that Stuart would change his name, which was unusual at the time. The archivist in Strokestown, Martin Fagan, explains exactly how far they went in this regard. But, you know, he's he's definitely marrying up. Okay. um, And the fact that he changes his name. So it's um, it's Olive Packenamahan, he's Stuart um, Hales, he becomes Stuart Hales packing a man. He changes his name and then his father, Stuart's father, changes his name okay. to make sure that, you know, the, the estate is, uh, stays in the family. Yeah. So, like, so she's definitely marrying down in some ways in, 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 in terms of class, you know. The wedding went ahead in London six days before Christmas in 1921 and the contrast between this celebration and Olive's first marriage was striking. Back in 1914, Olive had had eight bridesmaids, while the event had been attended by well-known figures in London society and widely reported in the press. In 1921, the London Pall Mall Gazette was one of the few publications to mention the service, but its article took a similarly dim view to her parents and adopted a snide tone. As several quiet weddings take place the last few days before Christmas, And yesterday, Olive King Harmon, widow of Captain Stafford King Harmon, was married to Mr. Stuart Hales, East Yorkshire Regiment, at the parish church, Brompton. The Bishop of London was to have tied the knot, but was prevented by illness. And unfortunately, the Dean of Durham was unable to present for the same reason. Now, while Olive's determination had seen her marry Stuart against her parents' wishes, Her hopes that the two would be able to settle down in married bliss in Ireland were something far beyond even her control, no matter what she did. Wider political events in the weeks that followed the wedding guaranteed that this would be difficult and perhaps even impossible. While Olive and her new husband, Stuart, went to France on honeymoon over that Christmas of 1921, the Irish Republican Parliament debated and subsequently ratified the treaty with Britain on January the 7th, 1922. This resulted in 26 counties of Ireland, including Olive's native Roscommon, leaving the United Kingdom and forming a largely independent state. For the Packenham Mahans, they could only wait with bated breath to see what this would actually mean. They were undoubtedly fearful. Revolutions elsewhere in recent years had had dire consequences for aristocrats. By 1922, Western Europe was awash with exiled Russian aristocrats whose property had been expropriated by the revolutionaries there. Olive herself was gloomy about the future, calling the Irish Republican leaders who were about to take power a gang of soft-faced, double-speaking, murdering swine. While the faction of the Republican movement who took power in Ireland would ultimately prove themselves to be deeply conservative and even shared a lot in common with Olive in terms of their outlook, this would only emerge in time. In those early weeks of 1922, life was laced with uncertainty. So much remained unclear. 
The year began with tragedy when her father Henry dropped dead on January the 12th in London. While this was a deep personal loss to Olive and her mother, his death couldn't have come at a worse time. Henry had been the one to manage the family finances over the last five decades and now they were heading into what were going to be very, very difficult days. It would fall to Olive to make major financial decisions, but as we will see, she was nothing short of disastrous on this front. While she mourned the loss of her father, Olive also had to contend with her major fears over the safety of her new husband, Stuart. They were living in Roscommon, but he had also served as a captain of the East Yorkshire Regiment, which had occupied Strokestown Park House during the War of Independence. In those early months of 1922, he had to try and transition to a civilian life in that same town that was now in the hands of his former enemies in the IRA. A major test of how he would be treated took place when he took the decision to try and secure a licence to hold a gun in order to shoot game in March 1922. Now to do this, he needed the permission of the IRA and on March 5th, he travelled to the IRA barracks at Boyle. He and Olive must have been deeply concerned about what reception he would receive. These were the same men he had hunted through North Roscommon only a few months earlier. Now when I visited Strokestown Park House, the archivist Martin Fagan took out an incredible piece of history that illustrated what took place at that meeting. 5th of March 1922, um, a a permit signed from the IRA barracks in Boyle um, to... W.A. Hales Esquire, Strokestown, Akara. You know, things have changed, you know. <laughs> uh, Repermits. In reply to your application for permit, same will be granted to you on receipt of cash. Price of price of permit to shoot game is two pounds. Yours truly, M. M. Fallon, uh, O.C. Operating Commander. So you know, within whatever, whatever three or four months, you know, the IRA are giving him a permit to go out and have his gun and shoot game. While this indicated that the IRA had no issue with Stuart, or at least they were going to allow him to live in Roscommon, he and Olive still couldn't rest easy. The country in general was in a pretty lawless state in early 1922. People were taking advantage of the changeover between the old British regime and the new Free State government, and this led to confusion about who precisely was in control. A confusion that thieves were willing to take advantage of in April 1922, a local bank near Strokestown was robbed and the assailants killed an IRA guard and made off with £7,000. Then in May 1922, a father and son who had served in the Crown Forces during the War of Independence were shot dead at Coot Hall, not far from Strokestown. A reminder to Stuart that all scores might yet be settled. Even if the IRA had no issue with Stuart, this didn't mean that people whose family members had suffered at the hands of the Crown forces might not act. The general sense of uncertainty only escalated when divisions over the treaty with Britain led to the outbreak of civil war in 1922. Now this of course is going to be the focus of my upcoming exclusive six-part supporters series with Dr Brian Hanley. You can get that by becoming a supporter at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. But back in 1922, those opposed to the treaty were extremely hostile to families like the Packin and Mahans, viewing them as a sort of fifth column in Ireland. Now, while most of the fighting was concentrated in the southwest, government influence and control over North Roscommon was limited. Sporadic IRA attacks continued against the Free State, police and army in the region. Living through such draining and stressful times from the death of her father in January 1922, through those days when they feared over Stuart's safety into the Civil War, appears to have taken a major toll on Olive. Martin explains. She seems to be very, very low after the death of her father. I think there's a few things going on, um, not only the death of her father, but she's, she takes herself away to, to England, to a, to a relative, to an aunt, and she's there for, uh, for a couple of months. And she's got medical problems as well. So, um, so whether, that, whether that was brought on by that her father or or there's other things coming at her. Despite all this, by early 1923, the situation for the Packin and Mahans, at least, was improving. It was becoming clear that the civil war would end in a victory for government forces, something that was generally welcomed by Irish unionists, like the Packin and Mahans. 
They had opposed independence, but by 1923 they had to adapt to the realities as they were. And the truth was, they shared more in common with the victorious side in the Civil War than either would have admitted a year earlier. Leading free state politicians such as W.T. Cosgrave and Kevin O'Higgins were deeply conservative and even came to recognise people like the Pakenham Mahans and similar families as political allies. Indeed, it became increasingly clear that Oliver Stewart had little to fear from the pretty limited ambitions for change that many free state politicians had. Olive herself would in fact later say that they treated her very well. Now as the last vestiges of the threats posed by the revolutionary era receded with the end of the civil war, there were signs that Olive and Stuart were actually starting that normal family life she had always wanted. She fell pregnant in March 1923, leading to the birth of Elizabeth Hales Packenham Mahan on December the 12th. She was the first of three children the couple had. Olive would give birth to twins a few years later. These were named Denise and Nicholas. Nicholas was presumably named after Nicholas Mann, the first of her family who had come to Roscommon back in the 1660s. Denise was presumably named after Dennis Mann, Olive's notorious great-grandfather, who had been assassinated during the Great Hunger after he had evicted large numbers of tenants. However, while the dangers posed by the revolutionary era may have been ending, this didn't resolve Olive and Stuart's biggest problem. And this was their complete inability to manage finances. The couple were nothing short of disastrous when it came to money. In late 1921, Olive had written a letter to Stuart saying, This will be a very short letter as I am very, very tired and worried. To come clean to what is the matter, I had an unpleasant epistle from the bank this morning. I thought I had some money there and apparently I hadn't. I know it sounds dreadful to say that one hasn't the remotest idea what one has at the bank, but I'm afraid I've always been rather casual and happy-go-lucky. But now I shall have an incentive to keep my accounts properly again. Stuart was no better. Oshin explained this while we walked around the house. He certainly, when he came in, had the idea that we need to try and diversify As I said, I've looked through some of his personal letters and he was trying to invest in things. He was trying to buy uh, the Arigna coal mines that's near here at one point. That fell through. He invested a lot of their money into efforts to do things like people who convinced him there were diamonds to be mined in Ulster and all these kind of projects. Unfortunately, when you read his letters, you kind of get the impression that people could sort of see him coming a bit because none of his investments paid out. It's worth saying at this point, they still had a large tract of land, some 1,200 acres in North Roscommon, not to mention their stocks and shares. They were by no means destined to lose everything. But as Martin Fagan explains now, Olive didn't change the way she viewed money or spent it. So she had a very extravagant lifestyle and I think it was hard for her, and perhaps her in particular, to kind of come to reality with the fact that their life, their lifestyles had completely changed. You know, that, you know, they lived in a splendid house, you know, had all the trappings of being wealthy, but they weren't cash. They didn't have cash. A lot of them, the estate had been sold, the land had been sold, and there were sh- stocks and shares. So they were mainly, mainly dealing in stocks and shares, and that was their income. And, uh, but they had a house still in London, in Pond Street in London, and they had the house here. But I think um, what's revealing about their it was revealing in Olive's letters is like this parallel of, of spending and spending spending gra- you know on, on horses and harrods and all of these type of things yeah, and spending a lot of money and at the same time not having um, not having ready cash they did try to cut back there's no question about this Olive in 1981 remembered the changes in her life after Irish independence when she said well The fancy lives that people led playing croquet and cards all night, that all changed. Life became more realistic. However, her ideas of cutting back were still an extremely extravagant lifestyle, as this letter from 1921 as well indicates. Darling, I am very bad at estimates, but my rough idea is that a house, three servants, Letice's governess, food coal and washing ought to be done at £1,000 per year. If it costs more, we must cut down a servant. 
It's no surprise that they continued living far beyond their means right through the 1920s. We get some trace of this extravagant lifestyle through archival sources. For example, they travelled to London regularly. Olive was photographed at Newbury Racecourse in 1925. And at the end of the decade, her and her mother May were passengers on a ship to Genoa, Italy. Inside the door of Strokestown Park House, there's also skis, another sign of an extravagant lifestyle few could afford. And we have skis that show that they were still going to Switzerland a few times. They went skiing. Again, that was something that sort of set them apart from the area. How many people in Ireland in the 1950s went on skiing holidays, right? So again, it's worth mentioning that when we talk about the decline, it wasn't like they were living in abject poverty, right? You get the sense, though, that in many respects, they're completely divorced from the reality of the changing world around them. And this wasn't just limited to finances. They were inculcating their young children with ideas of the old world, the one that Olive had grown up in, but that was gone. These were ideas that had shaped past generations of her family that didn't equip the children to live in the Irish Free State. They taught their children to take pride in the British Empire, for example, even though Irish society was clearly on a different path. Nicholas, the couple's only son, was raised in the military traditions of his ancestors that covered the walls of Strokestown. But this wasn't for a career in the Irish Free State Army. He would in time serve in the British Army, which would have terrible consequences, as we'll hear later in the episode. Through the 1930s, their lives continued as they spent what money they had. At the outbreak of the Second World War, with their allegiance to Britain, as it had always been, They spent much of that conflict in England, with Stuart serving in the British Army and Olive helping on the home front. But they did return to Ireland in the aftermath of the war. However, it was at this point that history began to catch up with the couple. A few decades of spending money with no clear source of income to match this expenditure left them in a very diminished position. The financial problems they faced were dire and by the 1950s this could no longer be hidden. Visitors to Strokestown Park House could see it plainly on the walls. Indeed, you can see this today when you visit the house. When we were standing in the dining room, a beautiful room, Ushin pointed to the walls and showed me this. At any of the walls in this room, you can see that there are these marks. There are marks left on the walls that were left behind when paintings were sold. Because this was a big feature of the last few decades. Any painting that had value was sold basically, to try and keep the place going. And as they're selling paintings, they would try and replace them with cheaper ones. But in the last few years, they couldn't even do that anymore. So big areas are left empty and these horrible, ugly marks are there. Now, Olive would take a novel approach to mask this problem, which left the room with a bizarre appearance in its later years. Oshin explains. Yeah, and I mean, that would have been, yeah, painful for them to look at and embarrassing when guests came. And that is why Olive eventually came up with a kind of unconventional solution. So if you look over at this wall, you might notice there's this area that looks very different, that it has this kind of rough sackcloth attached to it. So we've just got a little section here. Oh, so yeah. in the late 30s, we believe, Olive basically had the butler hang this rough, cheap sackcloth over all the walls in this room. She covered the walls in this stuff. And then when someone would ask, they'd say, well, what's with the cloth? She'd, oh, we're just in the middle of redecorating. We're just putting up new wallpaper. Nothing to see. Don't look. Don't look. And of course, they were claiming to they were redecorating for, I think, the best part of 50, 60 years, you know? And it, this is just to hide the embarrassment. To hide the sure. embarrassment. But I mean, it had uh, one really good side effect, which is that when we took off that sackcloth, the wallpaper had been really well preserved underneath, yeah. you know? Um, we just left a little bit there so you can kind of imagine the, the contrast of how different it would have looked. They had, however, in many respects, reached a point of no return. As their children grew up, they all departed. All of Olive's children lived in England, unsurprisingly. But Olive herself, along with Stuart, were now unable to manage the vast house they lived in and started to abandon several rooms. And without the money for upkeep, Strokestown Park House was rapidly deteriorating in the later 20th century. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, post-World War II, getting into the 1950s, 60s, um, their, yeah, their fortunes are declining pretty sharply. By that point, they're selling land. Uh, Stuart, her husband, had had these investments that he'd hoped would... He'd invested a lot of her money, basically, in different projects. He was trying to buy mines, and he was putting money into emerald mines and all these kind of different things, and basically none of them came to anything. Um, so as you get into the 50s and the 60s, 
less and less money. They go from selling land to selling furniture, to selling paintings, to selling jewelry, anything that, that they're willing to part with, they're getting rid of. And even then, you know, you can imagine, imagine the upkeep that a house like this takes, you know, like even just keeping this place running as a visitor attraction, it requires, I mean, I, I don't, I can't even tell you how much, right? Because it requires a lot of money, basically. There's always something that needs repairs. There's always something that's days away from collapsing or breaking. So by the 60s, it was getting so bad that they progressively began abandoning parts of the house. They abandoned the wings. They eventually abandoned the upper stories completely. By the 70s, they were living entirely on the ground floor. The upper floors were in several cases, I mean, you know, roofs were literally collapsing, ceilings were collapsing in. There was, I've been told that there were mushrooms like a foot or two across growing out of the walls in places. And yeah, eventually this room had become their bedroom. They'd moved a bed down here. Eventually they resorted to essentially building a conventional house inside what was a crumbling ruin. As Oshin mentioned, the drawing room had actually become a bedroom and Martin now explained what was happening in these later years. They're almost moving back into a, almost a, a, a normal type house, only it happens to be in a much bigger house. <laughs> what happened to the kitchen is intriguing. This was once a vast room. You might recall in episode one I talked about how it had this balcony overlooking the workspace. Anyway, this was obviously no longer needed by the 50s and the 60s and it was very nearly demolished. I mean, as you can kind of imagine, when we're getting to the 60s and it's Olive, it's her husband and a very small group of servants living in this house, this kitchen was excessive. It was too much. It was not practical. So Olive had a plan to tear everything out and to basically rebuild it all as a modern kitchen. And she hired an architect with this in mind. But the architect basically took one look at it and said, I can't bear to destroy something like this. This is so unique. So she came up with a very interesting and clever little idea. So basically, they built a false wall that ran from just that mark that you can see on the wall there, and they created a tiny little closed off space within this kitchen. So they built a new room within the room, and then they installed a modern 60s kitchen in there. So in the last few years, that's what they were using on a day-to-day -day basis to, to cook and everything, and everything else was hidden behind these false walls and forgotten about. They literally just walled it off and forgot about it until then, when the restoration began in the 1980s, basically they came in with a sledgehammer, they knocked down the false wall, and to their shock and delight, discovered that all this stuff was still there, you know, right there waiting to be found. Martin actually showed me a photograph of that tiny kitchen built inside the huge room. It was incredible. Originally I didn't know what I was looking at here, but the telltale signs are this press here, and this kind of quite oversized bench. Um, that's the bench on the side of the gallery kitchen but you can see a tubular chair um, you know a, a normal table with a, a, a Very table 1970s, 1970s yeah counter yeah yeah presses. yeah kind of your wood chip veneer you know veneer kind of um, presses and um, cylinder gas in the corner and uh, the windows look a bit too big the wallpaper is a little bit too elaborate but for all intents and purposes it's a 1970s house while the house declined, the future of the Pack and the Mahan family in Strokestown was never more uncertain. And I think Olive seems to have known this. By the 1950s, she clearly had an eye on her legacy and the legacy of her family. The National Library of Ireland had visited the house to survey the historic value of her family's papers. And realising their huge significance, the National Library convinced Olive to deposit them in their archive in Dublin, where they could be catalogued and well maintained. While Olive agreed to this, she did set down one condition. This was described by the archivist Susan Hood in the following terms. Mrs Packenham Mahan decided to retain papers dating from the famine period onwards in Strokestown for some reason which remains undocumented. I think it's fair to say that Olive was concerned what those papers might reveal about her ancestor Dennis Mahan, who had been assassinated back in 1847. He's mentioned a lot in episode one of this series. He was a man, though, with a legacy that had loomed large over her life. And Olive didn't see him in the way that other people did. She had, after all, named a daughter Denise, presumably in memory of him. And she defended his actions right down to her final interview in 1981. 
However, she could undoubtedly see that times were changing and history was going to take a much harsher view of his role and actions and motives in the 1840s. By preventing her family's papers dating from that period being placed in the National Library, she may have hoped that this would limit scrutiny of Dennis Mahan. Indeed, throughout her final years, she must have been acutely aware that families like her were not going to be remembered fondly. The relationship with the people of Strokestown had changed dramatically during her lifetime. No one doffed the cap anymore. Oshin explained this changing relationship when I visited Strokestown Park House. The impression I've gotten from talking to people in the town to remember, she became kind of like an eccentric. She was the town eccentric. She was this character that people could kind of laugh a little bit because she was, she, and she would do things like if she walked into the post office and there was a queue, she would walk past the queue and up to the front. And many times I've talked to people who, you know, you know, didn't, they didn't take that as and they told her, no, you get to the back. And she would do it then, you know, she wouldn't argue. However, Olive herself never really fully accepted that her position had changed. She had been raised to think she was superior and acted accordingly. There's a story as well that once supposedly the uh, guards were out near here doing checks for um, drink driving in the 70s and they're there stopping cars. Olive comes along in her Renault 4 and she slows down very slightly, sticks her head out the window and says, it's only me and speeds past, you know? So that was her attitude. She's still on some level, I think, you know, carried that sense in her head that she was different to everyone. She was slightly, slightly above everyone, even though in her later years, you know, the, the, the decline is serious. They have no money, right? And they're living in basically two rooms out of this whole building, you know? In the end, it wasn't the ghosts of past generations or their relationship with the local community that would bring the Packenham Mahan's presence in Strokestown to an end. But it was the actions of a family member who was involved in one of the darker chapters of recent Irish history. Hey folks, I hope you're enjoying this episode. Before we move into the final section of Olive's story, don't forget you can get the second of what is now two supporters shows from Strokestown at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. By becoming a show supporter, you'll also get access to tons of other bonus content, as well as my upcoming exclusive series on the Civil War with Dr. Brian Handy. You can get all that at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. By the early 1970s, Olive and Stuart were both nearing the end of their lives and the time had come to pass the house on to the next generation, in this instance, their son, Nicholas. There was no question he was very much a man in the family tradition. However, this ultimately would prevent him from living in Strokestown. Just like generations of his family, he had joined the British Army in 1945, serving in the Grenadier Guards. By the 70s, he had risen to the rank of colonel and played a prominent role in the escalating conflict in the north of Ireland, serving in Derry. Now, this naturally alienated him from wider Irish society and prevalent views on the conflict in the north. But perhaps more seriously, it also made him a target for the provisional IRA. It was inconceivable that he would return and live in rural Roscommon, even if he wanted to restore the house. Indeed, on the rare occasions he did visit Olive and Stuart, it was always unannounced and he was accompanied by a special branch officer. As the 1970s wore on, Olive and Stuart were increasingly isolated in Roscommon. Other families like theirs had died off or sold up. The King Harmons, the family of Olive's first husband, had left the county years earlier. Rockingham, their home, had been burned in an accidental fire in 1957 and lacking the money to rebuild it, what remained of their estate was sold off and they moved elsewhere. The servants were also long gone. Olive and Stuart couldn't afford to pay them, and they weren't needed. The last to remain was a man called Thomas Massey. He was a butler and fitted in well, because he too was in many respects a man from another age. Martin explains more about Thomas Massey here. We don't know very much about him. Um, you know, you hear a lot of stories about him from people in the town who knew Olive back in the 80s. You know, he's a very eccentric character. He, he's actually from a place called the Hill of Down, which is um, in, in the Mead West Mead border, that area. And he came down here. He, from what I've heard from people, he's definitely institutionalised in, in that he'd spent all his life here. He's, he's a 
career at Butler and as the family you know as the fortunes of Olive and, and, and Stuart kind of wane uh, financially he's, he's the last one with them along with their nurse and uh, they seem to have been a kind of a, an eccentric little group and he's part of that eccentric group he's eccentric around, around Strokestown and people have stories about him around Strokestown he, um, and um, yeah he, he was very loyal to her he stayed you know I've spoken to his um, his nephew and uh, he said that you know he spent his whole life in Strokestown and he only came back he only left Strokestown really when when she was leaving you that know was, around years really he, she, he said that it was very traumatic for him um, you know spending all your life in a place like Strokestown you know in, in this house and having I suppose a station and having a purpose and so they must have this kind of you know, if you're around them for so long, um, they ha- must have had this kind of relationship, you know, in... in normality. Normality, yeah. yeah. But then he goes back to his family and spends his, his final days in, in, you know, so that, so that must have been very traumatic for him. We have very, very little, actually nothing from him. I found one Christmas card addressed to him, to Tossie. Um, it's just that one there, and it's the only thing I found in the whole of the collection. Christmas greetings, I don't even have the year... But um, I would guess it's sometime in the 1970s. Yeah, dear Tossie, hope you have a very nice Christmas. Wish you all the best in the new year. From Mrs. Lynham, Mick, Frank and Nancy. So, yeah, so, you know, he leaves no mark really here. There was almost the feel of a comic tragedy in the final days of life in Strokestown Park House. Each day, Thomas Massey donned a threadbare butler's livery, maintaining the pretense of another era. This uniform is actually in the house. Martin Fagan now describes what it actually looked like. I think they, they think that he's, uh, his uniform, his really treadbare butler's uniform is in the house. Um, treadbare as in it had been stitched and sewed a hundred times and buttons are just hanging off it. But he obviously was wearing it up to the end. Having sold everything in the house in an effort to survive, the logical end result of all this was that the house itself would eventually have to be sold. And in the late 1970s, facing increasing financial problems, Olive contacted the auctioneers Savills. They visited Strokestown and drew up a brochure for a public auction. Martin has actually found a copy of this in the archive. But this this Savills um, brochure kind of goes through all the contents. There's some photographs uh, as the photographs of the dining room, all nicely done up, and the gate. Um, it says that it's you know 86 miles from Dublin, 30 miles from Munningar. Dublin and Shannon airports are within two-hour drive. So one of Ireland's finest 17th-century houses with a fertile arable farm extending to about 290 acres, mainly within the main wall. Ultimately, it wouldn't come to this. The sale of Strokestown Park House did take place, but it was done by private negotiations. Olive had actually contacted a local businessman, Jim Callery, who she wanted to buy the house because she felt he would look after it. Eventually, the sale was, was a private sale. Um, I think Jim Callery describes it as, as something that happened in, in London. You know, solicitors shuffling between rooms in a hotel and that's, uh, that's how the sale was agreed. But Olive um, apparently um, called Jim up to the house um, told him the house was been sold, you know, it was her son's house, the, the whole of the house has been sold and said, if you're interested in buying it, it's been sold. And to, you know, really to get him interested and pretty encourage him to, to buy it. And she, and, and, and part of that sale was that Jim, um, well, Jim made an agreement with her that she could stay in the house for as long as she liked. Well, yeah. So at the, in her interview with, um, her last interview, a radio interview, she says that, you know, she talks about Jim Callery being a very kind man. It's, it's his house. I'm living here under, by his kindness. It's his house, not my house. This arrangement guaranteed Olive and Stuart would have security in their final days. But ultimately, they didn't have long to live. Although he was the younger of the two, Stuart was the first to die, passing away in March 1980. This left Olive in the house with the butler, Thomas Massey, as the first anniversary of Stuart's death approached in 1981, Olive finally took the decision to leave the house. She was well into her 80s by this point and it was not suitable given her failing health. Indeed, it was scarcely habitable for anyone by this point. In March 1981, she relocated to a nursing home in Newbury, England, close to where her children lived. 
In the week before she left, the journalist Jim Fahey interviewed her and in his final question, he asked Olive about what the future held in store for her as she finally left her home of eight decades. She said, Mm, Nothing. Death. (laughs) I'm going to be put away in this nursing home near Newbury and... um, In due course, I shall die. Olive wasn't wrong. Removed from Strokestown Park House, she appears to have struggled. She left Ireland on March 10th, 1981, and died just over three months later, on June 19th, that same year. She was 86. Olive's body was returned to Strokestown, but she wasn't buried in the family crypt on the estate alongside her ancestors. For reasons not entirely understood, Olive and Stuart are buried in the Catholic graveyard in Strokestown. Something that would have horrified past generations of her family. How this came to pass is something of a mystery. Olive wasn't a Catholic. Her death brought to an end the Pakenham Mahans' connections to Strokestown. Now one final story perhaps conveys that complex relationship between the Pakenham Mahans and the community they lived beside for over 300 years, yet were always removed from. After Olive's death, Jim Callery, who had bought the house, opened it to the public, eventually doing so on a permanent basis in 1987. On one of the first times it was opened, however, Oshin now explains how local people flocked to see this house that had shaped their community for centuries, leading to this humorous conclusion to the story. Senator David Norris has told a story multiple times uh, that he remembers because he was, David Norris was here when the house was opened for the very first time in 1981 to visitors. So we had loads of the locals coming into the house and he was kind of wandering around, you know, looking through things and he opened a door and there was this old woman in there putting on all of shoes. And she kind of looked up for a second like, oh, I've been caught. And then she smiled and said, they're gone. That's where I'm going to bring Olive's story to an end. You can visit her home, Strokestown Park House today, I have links in the show notes below to that. You can get the bonus content I recorded in Strokestown Park House at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. And now all that's left for me to say at this point is until next time, Sloan.